it's very important to the process of understanding Google Cloud and pass the certification exam that you go through the question and attempt answering it yourself first. So pause the video, work through the question. We'll catch up in just a little while and I'll show you how I do it. This project scenario is based on the EHR case study. The EHR sales employees are a remote-based workforce that travels to different locations to do their jobs. Regardless of the location, the sales employees need to access web-based sales tools located in the EHR data center. EHR is retiring their current virtual private network or VPN infrastructure, and you need to move the web-based sales tools to a Beyond Corp access model. Each sales em employee has a Google Workspace account and uses that account for single sign-on or SSO. What should you do? So let's look at the requirement analysis um, based on the key indicators in this question. First, of course, is that there is a company with a data center and there are a bunch of apps which need to be accessed by employees who are not inside the data center or inside the office. So they could be anywhere. They could be out doing sales. They could be frontline workers and they need access to some of the web applications within the data center. So the employees are remote and what they were doing earlier was to probably give what is called a virtual private network access, which means that they can log into the data center from somewhere else over this infrastructure. Now let's try to understand what this VPN is a little more. Another video I would strongly recommend that you watch uh, to understand this entire question and it also explains VPN and the uh, problems with uh, that is this video terminologies to zero trust security that's also part of the awesome GCP channel so please go take a look uh, at that more detailed video but for the purposes of this uh, question let me give you just the highlights of it what a VPN does is to give a user who's away from the data center away from the network a way to access it so the virtual private network typically encrypts the channel between a remote user uh, somewhere out in the field or working from home and says here is a way to enter the data center or enter the network and access the applications within it. In many cases it's possible that once you get access to the network you're given access to almost all the apps within it. Right? So somebody outside the network has to authenticate themselves but once they're inside they have fairly high privileges or fairly wide privileges. Now the issue with having fairly wide and fairly high privileges is that if for some reason this person loses their credentials or their credentials get stolen, maybe they left their laptop already logged in somewhere or they wrote their password down somewhere and in some way somebody was able to get their credentials, then it becomes fairly straightforward for that person, for that thief, for that malicious user to log, over, log in over the VPN network into the um, yeah, into the uh, company's network, into the company's data center. And once they have that access, given that the original user had fairly wide and fairly high privileges, this malicious user also has the same set of privileges, which is obviously not a good thing. Right? Um, with this company, they want to avoid this kind of an approach. And they're saying, you know what, no VPN, but they should still be able to access this network from anywhere and still have high security. And as I indicated in this diagram, right, as soon as that person has access to one application, typically they might have access to all the other ones, which is a dangerous thing to have. The next point in that is that they need to move to a web-based sales tool, uh, move, move their web-based uh, sales tool to a Beyond Corp access model. Now, the Beyond Corp access model is uh, Google's implementation of what is called Zero Trust Security Model. Let's just take a quick look at that. In the zero trust security model, unlike the previous case that we saw, that once the user enters that network, they have wide access to all the applications and machines within that network, the zero trust security model says we trust nothing and nobody. So every resource essentially has a very tight perimeter around it of security. So if this user wants to access this virtual machine, that user will have to authenticate for just that machine. If there was yet another machine like that, they would have to authenticate separately. It's not that once they enter this network, 
they can access all the machines and devices say via this particular VM. So at every point in that conversation between machines apps users, there is going to be a challenge for um, authentication and authorization before they're given the privileges and permissions to perform any action on that resource. Even if there are other applications running within the same network, each of them also have a security perimeter around it. So this application, if it has to access the application on this uh, virtual machine, it still has to authenticate itself. So also for devices within the network and so also for people and users within the network. So the zero trust security model essentially says we, pro we by default provide zero trust, right? We have zero trust in anybody and anybody who wants to access applications devices, they will have to continuously authenticate themselves. So that is the model that they want to go to and um, beyond Corp is one implementation. The last point, key point here is that uh, each of the sales employees have a Google Workspace account. So if we have a solution on Google Cloud that works with Gmail, then that is good right? with a Google Workspace account. With that overall understanding, let's now look at each of the options. The first option says create an identity aware proxy or an IAP connector that points to the sales tool application. Let's try to understand what IAP is. So in this case, to illustrate the key requirement, right, there is a data center. Inside, there are a bunch of web applications. Now, in our case, we have salespeople outside the network or the field or, you know, working from home, and they want to access the web app, which is a sales uh, web application. We can generalize this and say there might be multiple applications and people uh, you know, working in that company, employees, they will require access to some of these applications while not having access to some of the others. And we won't have a way to control that. One way to do this individually for each application is to provide separate credentials for each of them. So for example, if this user wants to access application number one, they will have a username password for that. If they want to access the second one, they, they will have a username password for that. And if they don't have one, they can't access it, right? So on for the third and fourth one, that in this case, the first and the third one, they have separate logins and the second and fourth one, they probably don't have logins. And that's how you could potentially control it. Obviously, what you can see in this case is for a company, sometimes on the bigger ones, you know, they'll have hundreds or even thousands of applications running. And it becomes difficult to have individual credentials for each of these applications. Right? And the effort when in terms of IT, in terms of building the application, all of that becomes excessive. What the identity aware proxy provides is a central point of identity management when it comes to authentication for these web applications. So in this case, um, instead of having separate credentials for each of them, you have one central place where um, you have access to the identity and the identity aware proxy also has mechanisms within it to ensure that the person who's logged in and to ensure that the, uh, the user who's trying to access the application has the privileges to do so. In that uh, approach, identity aware proxy also supports the usage or, or uh, the usage of identity providers like Gmail and Google Workspace with Gmail and even other uh, providers like Active Directory or LDAP, which via Google Cloud Directory Sync can be made to work with identity aware proxy. There are also ways to make it work with uh, other authentication mechanisms, mechanisms like OAuth and OIDC and SAML. So it's quite flexible uh, in being able to work with different identity providers, which might be the case for certain organizations which had existing ways in which to authorize and authenticate users, right? So for example, in this particular questions case, they already have some mechanism, right? And is there a way we can attach that to identity aware proxy would be a uh, part of the requirement at a later stage. So at this point, what we can see is that this becomes a, a central point in which identities are mapped and it allows users and requests to pass through only if they meet 
the requirements and the policy set in that identity aware proxy, right? And they can say, you know, we have access to this application, but not to this one, and only those are allowed, while the others will be denied by IAP. So coming back to this option then, if we create an identity aware pro proxy and we said, you know what, allow the sales tool application to be accessed by just the sales team, we can do that, right? Because now we've got the, the we've got the Google Workspace uh, Gmail IDs and you can say these users are allowed or better still make a group of the uh, sales team and then add that group into IAP or set the permissions for that application and say, you know, allow uh, IAP to allow these users through, right, the sales employees through into the sales application. So with these requirements, let's see how IAP works uh, for those. IAP itself does not use VPN, right? Uh, IAP, the earlier ways that we used to do things were that me as a user, right, if I was traveling, I would be given a VPN account. I log into our central data center over the VPN and then access the applications that I have to write, the uh, applications are running inside that data center, inside that company's network. And IAP does not require that. So that's convenient because anyway, uh, EHR is planning to retire their uh, VPN infrastructure. IPN allows access to web apps from anywhere. Um, this also increases sometimes the speed and the user experience um, or it improves the user experience. Because unlike earlier when we had to log in via the VPN to a data center, IAP runs on Google's global infrastructure, right? So the same way in which you have very quick access to search and YouTube and all these other services, uh, Google Cloud Platform also makes use of the same network, right? So you will be routed to the closest point where there is a Google network facility, right? Where there's a Google Cloud Platform facility, which means that users now are not all going through into same VPN to same region, same location, but from all over the world, they have um, fairly similar latencies, right? Very uh, fast access um, in um, to get to IAP. So that's very convenient, right? So not only can they access these web applications from anywhere because it will get routed to the particular application you define, but the user experience could also be much better. IAP follows a zero trust model, right? So the and zero trust, as I said, is implemented as beyond core uh, within uh, Google Cloud. So uh, that also is a uh, check for us. Um, IAP supports Google Workspace accounts. Um, so again, since our salespeople in EHR have a Google Workspace account, IAP will be uh, very much suitable for their requirement. So considering all these points, it looks like option A fits us perfectly, but since we haven't seen the other options B, C, and D, um, let's just park this one as a very highly probable candidate. Option B suggests that we create a Google group for the sales tool application and upgrade that group to a security group. So what is a Google group? In a Google group, you're able to put different kinds of identities, right? Say, for example, a Gmail ID, a Google Workspace ID, a service account, or a Google group, or an entire domain itself. And say, all the members within this particular group share a common set of roles and permissions. So if, for example, I created, I set privileges at the group level, saying this group has the privilege to create a new user account, as the privilege to delete a project, all those privileges are automatically inherited by the members of this group. Okay? So it's a convenient way in which to manage uh, many users, or sets of users who all have to have the exact same privileges. And therefore, given that we've set the privileges so, it becomes easy to um, add and remove members all with the same privileges. Right? So if you, if you had salespeople, say for example, they'll have say five or six privileges, and we add only those people to the group, right? And if somebody moves away from the sales team, we just remove that person, all those privileges also are removed. So a convenient way to uh, manage uh, multiple users with the same kind of role setting requirement. And the kind of uh, privileges you set, right, and the permissions that uh, are, are defined as part of Google Cloud, right? So for example, in this case, we're saying, this particular user who is, I mean, so this particular group that is assigned a service account creator, all the members within that 
will have the ability to create service account, to get the details of individual service accounts, list all service accounts, so on and so forth. But the problem with that, even though we can, it's convenient for us to group these users and we can say, you know what, salespeople, they have common privileges. There are a few things that do not work for us. Groups do not inherently have this concept of zero trust uh, security model embedded within it, right? Just because you create uh, created as part of a group, you can't just say, okay, now it is automatically zero trust or you don't have an option to say, make it zero trust. That is not there, right? The concept is not there. There is also no entity called a security group, right? There's nothing within Google uh, Cloud Platform to say, you know what, here's a user with a security permission. It just isn't there, right? So it's insensible to, um, uh, I mean, that, that particular recommendation is, is insensible, right? You could say you, they have particular security permissions and you can assign those privileges and permissions and roles, but um, you don't just have something called a security group. Uh, also, when you set any kind of permissions uh, and roles for you know, a group or a member, you are essentially assigning Google Cloud's predefined permissions, right? So that works at the level of Google Cloud Platform. And it has no knowledge of how the application should have privileges, right? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have a way to say this user can uh, use app the sales application or not, right? Such a permission does not exist. At that level, when you are um, when you're giving permissions at the GCP level, right? So, in general, um, option B does not work for us, and we can definitely eliminate that. Option C suggests that we deploy an external HTTPS load balancer and create a custom cloud armor policy for the sales tool application. The HTTPS load balancer is you know it's kind of going the right direction because it says you know it's globally available and you can get to your VPC and your data center very quickly via the globally spread HTTPS load balancer, right? So it kind of seems that, okay, that's a good starting point. But then what's the second part? Create a custom cloud armor policy for the sales tool application. Now, cloud armor provides a DDoS protection, provides a web application firewall, and it essentially works at the outer edge of the Google network, uh, providing defense against things like a DDoS attack. Right? And it's primarily to say when there's a lot of anonymous users, say, you know, uh, sending unnecessary malicious illegitimate traffic to the network, it is able to stop that traffic well early on, right? Just at the edge of the network, instead of allowing it to come uh, inside the VPC, inside the Google uh, data centers. So the purpose of Cloud Armor is primarily for that. What are the problems with this with solving our particular requirement? It is not linked to an identity provider, right? You can't put a, um, a, a policy or a setting within Cloud Armor to say, here, this user called abcd at gmail.com should be able to access the sales uh, application that we are running, right? That kind of an option just isn't there. So there's no linkage to an identity provider uh, and to allow them uh, or deny them requests based on that identity. And similar to the other one, this is not a way to provide authentication authorization on specific apps. Right? It, you can't do that on Cloud Armor. So option C is also out for us. Uh, the last uh, option is that for every sales employee who needs access to a sales tool application, give their Google Workspace user account the predefined App Engine Viewer role. So in this case, the salespeople do have a Google Workspace account and they're saying, let's add that user uh, with a particular role called the App Engine Viewer role. Now, if we look at the possible, um, you know, uh, viewer roles within App Engine, these are some of them, right? I mean, these are the two, App Viewer and Code Viewer. The App Viewer allows the user to do a few things at the level of App Engine, right? With managing the App Engine resources. Say, for example, it's able to get details about the applications. It can get details about the instances running the uh, App Engine app. It can list the instances. It can get the services that are running, what versions they're running, so on and so forth. Again, as you can see, the permissions are at the level of the resource itself, right? In this case, the product being App Engine. At that level, they have the ability to view certain uh, uh, certain uh, uh, attributes of that um, of that uh, product as it is running right now. So 
here also you will see that the im role uh, im roles they provide privileges at the gcp resource level right you don't have a permission if you just want to go back and see this you don't have a permission here to say you know allow the sales application to uh, have users use it right these particular set of users um, give them permissions on the sales application that isn't there right so even at this level it's not possible another thing obviously is that there is no indication here that the sales tool is written in app engine even if you assume yes maybe it is written in app engine it is unlikely that the rest of the applications are going to be on app engine right so this is in any way not going to be a universal solution right it anyway doesn't work but um, we can't even make the assumption that all the applications are written in app engine so overall option d is also not useful for us and we have to eliminate it looking at it overall then the only option that suits us and it suits us very well is option a which is to create an identity aware proxy or an iap connector that points to the sales to application if you find these videos useful consider supporting me on patreon or buy me a coffee also don't forget to like share and subscribe for more learning videos on awesome gcp